So welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. And boy, have we got a cracking game for you today to discuss. We always look back at an iconic game um, in sometime in the annals of football history to talk about and the social context. And let's not forget the musical context as well. And I think our guest will be really up for the musical context. Not sure if the legendino Tim Vickery will be, though, but a cracking match. What do you say, Tim? Yeah, I'm ready to get down Saturday night and I'm ready to get down for this game. And I believe that one of our own, he was there. And that makes me very, yeah. very jealous indeed. Tommy Stewart, the floor is yours. Oh, baby. Nice to be back, lads, by the way. Lovely to see you both. Um, we've Let's not pretend we didn't do our pleasantries before the record. Let's, uh, you know, let's break well, the fourth we wall didn't. here. We didn't. We, we not many. Th th there's, there's no pleasantries here, mate. <laughs> yeah, mate. mate. We're talking, podcast. The, we're talking about the 23rd of April, 2003. Where yes. were you? Pleasantries with someone who burnt down his science lab at school. What on earth do you expect? <laughs> it's not you, Tommy. He's referring to me. But I, I thought so. You so that I could join in. <laughs> anyway. So, yes, on that date, Don. Oh, God, 2003. I would have been... How, how old were you? 13. I would have been oh. 13 years old. Uh, which is, you know, the prime time to... Uh, I have I always look back on 2003, actually, as the... It's the year where, you know, I first, you know, not became a football nerd, but, you know, I was playing sort of football manager. I was reading more about football, buying more football books, watching yeah. more games that weren't just Man United, sort of just being obsessed with all elements of football. And this game was at Old Trafford. It was Manchester United versus uh Real Madrid and it was the most sort of peak Galactico era of Real Madrid wasn't it although I suppose it was pre-Beckham because he was he was actually on Man United's uh bench that night which I'm sure we'll get to later which I think he he spoke about actually quite in in quite a lot of detail on the the Netflix documentary as well about how he sort of felt about that and how that, that decision actually by Sir Alex Ferguson influenced what was to happen that summer, which was Beckham moving to Madrid. But yeah, oh God, it, I will, I've, I've said, we probably said it that night because I was with my two brothers and my dad. We were very high up, proper in the guards of the North Stand, what's now the Sir Alex Ferguson Stand. And we knew that it was special. We I'm Like, I, I, I'm, I don't think I'll, I've already conceded at, at the age of 34, I don't think I'll ever see a game like that again and so many superstars just in one on on one pitch on both and sides on up. both sides yeah, turning up as well you know yeah. oh everyone like the you know what surprised me most by watching it back um and i was always a big fan of Juan Sebastian Veron for man united i i always thought he was hard done by and you know the reason ferguson paid so much money for him was because we needed an extra midfielder in europe that that was the main reason yeah. and he was obsessed with winning the European Cup again. And, you know, that wasn't going to happen with only Paul Scholes and Roy Keane. And, you know, you had people like Nicky Butt in the background, but who was a very good player and a very loyal servant to Man United. But but he was moving beyond 4-4-2, wasn't he? Exactly. He thinking, we, we, we've got to do something different. That's it, yeah. He was he was pivoting towards the 4-3-3 or 4-2-3-1, or however you want to sort of look at it. Um but yeah, watching the highlights back, Juan Sebastian Ron was brilliant that night. And I remember thinking that at the time as well. Like he he had that sort of effortless cool about him, but also he had that Argentinian thing in, in him. He had that sort of that, for lack of a better word, what the kids say now, he had that dog in him. He, he sort of chased it around and he got involved. And my favorite thing about Juan Sebastian Veron that is the sort of, the languid, it, well, it appeared languid, but it it probably, you know, there's hours and hours of practice, but the way he just pinged it with the outside of his foot, it was, you know, he barely used his left foot, but in the best way possible because he yeah. was such a master of the outside of his right foot. And I, I discovered him first time in Argentina, which was early two, early 1996. He was still with his studiantes. He was just moving to, to Boca then before going off to Europe. And I thought, wow, what is yeah. this? This really is... 
a fantastic player. I think maybe, I think United didn't really quite know how to use him. I thought there were times when they used him in front of, of the line of the ball. Yes. Which is the problem of trying to have him in with Roy Keane, I suppose. Because he's not that quick. You know, he's he's maybe not as languid as he looks, but he's not. But, so you want him with the full panorama of the field in front of him. So that range of passing can really, really come in, in into effect. But he did have some great nights for United in oh. the European games. Didn't yes, he, didn't... exactly. Yeah, they, they, they were mainly the European games that he that he did excel. And you're totally right, because I think by that time, uh, you know, Roy Keane had transitioned, obviously, from being a box to box almost, you know, in the early 90s. He was he was a goal scorer midfielder, wasn't he, really? Yeah. I don't really remember that version of him, but I've, you know, I've seen the videos and I've seen what he was like at Nottingham Forest and the reason why Man United bought him. But obviously by 2003, he was, what, two or three years away from leaving Man United and therefore retirement. And he took up that sort of, that, you know, sitting the, the Makaleli role, the sitting in front of, shielding the centre-backs role, which again, also Roy Keane, I've, from from the highlights I watched and from my memory, I don't think he put a fo foot wrong all night. And that's not to say Veron should have been in his position. It's just, you know, three world-class centre midfielders, none of them particularly quick by this point in their careers. How, how do you, you know, square pegs, round holes, maybe? So just for the context, United have gone to Real for the, the first leg. They've gone to Madrid and they've lost 3-1. But with the way goals are all in operation, that goal is it Van Van Nistelrooy gets it. Yes. That goal is a real is a real kind of lifeline. So uh, I imagine as you're there taking your seat, seats in the in, in the north stand, is that at, at one of the sides? It's not behind the goal, is it? Yeah, one of the sides. Yeah, it's it's the massive one. It's the one that's like you know when you're on when you're at the top of it. And you know, luckily, I've not. I, I don't know if I, the the sort of fear of heights I've developed in adulthood. I don't know if I can hack it up there anymore. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, 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 I've been to the Bernabeu and that's the only thing I can compare it to in in that it's almost vertical. It feels mm -hmm. like you're kind of looking down a cliff edge being at the top of it. And as you're looking down your cliff edge, you're thinking, taking your seats, we've got that away goal. We're in this match. Yeah. We mustn't concede early. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then R9, Ronaldo. Oh. The real Ronaldo. Yes. R9. Um, yes. In perhaps, well, who knows whether this was the best goal of the match because there's more to come from R9. <laughs> uh, so he's coming from the right and he does, he's faster than everybody else. He's like sprinting against Carl Lewis with the ball. <laughs> and I, I personally, just watching it back, I, I couldn't believe it. And I thought, whoa, I'm sure everybody in that stadium felt a similar reaction. It's yes. a fabulous movement of the ball, isn't it? With, it's, Zidane plays it in it's from, from wide on the left. Fabulous pass from Guti. Oh. But you're thinking there that Ronaldo's going into a space. You're not expecting him to score from that mm. space, are you? You're thinking, who else is getting in, getting in, into the box for him, him to square to? And maybe your goalkeeper, Tommy, was thinking the same thing. Fabian Bartes, yeah, the the man that. Um, well, I play I play six aside as a goalkeeper. I'm I'm playing straight after this, and that's what everyone calls me these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as you, you know, did Paris, haven't you recently? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but you know what? I I'm gonna go goalkeepers union here actually, and say I I don't think there's too much he could have done, mm. only because of the sort of the the veracity the the aggression that ronaldo hits the ball with like it's and it kind of bounces before him as well and also i think another thing you know maybe his positioning could be better bartes but you don't expect him to go near post i i don't think and maybe he's not got loads on i would also argue maybe rio i think it's rio who was marking him or attempting to mark him maybe rio could have done a little bit more there as well got a little bit tighter to him but at the end of the day, you just have to appreciate genius, and and that's what he was. That's what he is. And and I remember so vividly, and almost triggering watching it back. That silence that happens at Old Trafford or English clubs in a European game, when because they've probably got less fans 
than a Premier League club might have with them. Although I remember the Madrid, you can't hear it on the highlights, but I remember all night the Madrid fans being very loud, even though there wasn't many of them. And I remember the constant buzz of, even though he, I think he was injured, Raul, and he was, mm. he probably would have been my favourite player in that team at the time, actually. Uh, but I just remember the constant Raul, 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 Raul. And it's like a different way of singing, isn't it? It's a different way of chanting. But yeah, as soon as that goal went in, um, it, it's silence. It's that eerie silence of a football stadium where there's, you know, a, about what, three, four thousand hours. So what? I, I don't know. My maths is, is very bad, but about 5% of a lot of people going crazy, but the rest just pure shock and silence and and you think by that point that you know the match has gone away from us it's it's you know? a night of sounds isn't it it's a it's well, a night that really must have, have filled the senses and i know we're I'm, I'm jumping well forward but everyone knows this is ronaldo's yeah. night and I, see i love those moments <sighs> when a home crowd realizes the genius of of an away player yeah. I love those moments. I think they're, they're, they're special moments in football. So if that silence is when he scores, the first goal is one of the defining things. Another of the defining things of this evening is the applause that you gave him when he came when he came off the field yeah. after having knocked, knocked, knocked your team out. Were you participating in this applause or were you a spiteful 13-year-old? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote this down when I, in my notes when I was, when I was going through it. And I, I think... What I remember is initial initially being shocked and probably refusing to stand up. And then my dad sort of pulling me up and saying, come on. Um, but then, yeah, like you say, I, I think it's that's probably the best, most uh, ethereal experience I've had in a football stadium. Like it was just totally, it's life affirming in a way because we're all so invested in this team that we we adore you know, my dad adored the Busby Babes. My older brother adored Brian Robson. And I adore Roy Keane and Paul Scholes and David Beckham and me and my little brother. You know, that's that there are heroes. And we've all been stood there since the, you know, my dad's been there in the in the 1960s. And never before or since have I experienced that. I don't know if my dad's ever experienced it either, because um he was there when Maradona came in 1984, but I think Brian Robson was the star of that night. Um, it, it was Maradona when he was at Barcelona, so, you know, not the best version of him, maybe. Uh, but to see one of the best players of all time and to feel that, you know, just sheer admiration from 74,000 people on the opposition team, because it, and the reason I say it's life affirming is because it just shows, you know, it, it's one of those rare glimpses of, you know the the goodness in humanity to be honest mm. the generosity of of so many people and it, i felt proud to be a man united fan as well and then what i remember as well i can't remember if you catch this on the highlights but i remember not long after the the standing ovation when he got took off after the hat trick uh, 10 minutes of just Fergie, sign him up, Fergie, Fergie, <laughs> sign him up. <laughs> Which uh, I think would probably have been a mistake. Yeah, by that point, yeah. Yeah, and he was, uh, and the Ronaldo stories, I'm quite surprised sometimes how much it's been eclipsed, perhaps by the, you know, the subsequent Ronaldo and, and, and so on. But most people, certainly myself included, but people who know much more about medical stuff than I do, thought he was, he was never going to play again. Uh, yeah. You know, after the because the two times when his knee collapses, and you are you're just howling with pain, and you're thinking that's then he, he won't be back from that. And he comes back and he wins the 2002 World Cup with a team that probably shouldn't have qualified, and that's the difference <laughs> that he made. Uh, it's a fabulous story that Ronaldo come back, oh, and then, yeah. but he, he does kind of pay a price for it because he, he's reached a stage in his life when. It's not easy to motivate himself week in, week out. It's not easy. Uh, and so after that, you get it in in occasional moments. I had one just a year later than this when he played for Brazil against Argentina in Belo Horizonte, in the stadium where he first made his name. And he knew that it was going to be the biggest game he ever played in Brazil. He knew it. So, wow, was he up for it. 
And he <laughs> Argentina played all the football and Brazil won 3-1. And he scored all three. All three were penalties. He suffered all three penalties. And he scored all three penalties. And Argentina, they just couldn't stop him. But the Knights like that, they were becoming a little bit rationed because yeah. he was, you know, he, I don't think he, he, he I think he got, just got bored with all of the all of the physical necessities needed to keep himself at that level. And yeah, don't you think? Don't think he. So it would have been a mistake, I think, for for Fergie to 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 have signed him up. Oh um, yeah, so, but I would have loved to have had a Man United shirt with Ronaldo number nine on the back. Although, I, I mean, was it? Yeah, it would have been that summer actually. A couple of months, two months after that, that we would have signed Cristiano Ronaldo. So it was I, think, that I, I think we yeah, made the right. Summer. Yeah, we made the right. I think Ferguson once again made the right decisions there. But and yeah, obviously I, it, it wasn't only him; it was the Galactico hero and Zidane. It just so, Zidane is oh. just so unbelievably elegant. I did this TV documentary recently about the Galacticos, and they they said choose one of all of them, and I said, well, there's obviously two who are who stand head and shoulders, and that's Zidane and Ronaldo. And I thought about it, and I thought, well. Personally, I'd probably rather watch Zidane. Yes, same. But I'd rather face him as well if I'm the opposition. Because Ronaldo, just it, the threat to the goal is so much bigger from him than it is from... from from. But to see them both click oh. together, that, that yeah. I'm, I'm very jealous of you. For, it's just for an honour. Yeah, it's just an honour. And to see them both at their best, and I'd forgotten how well Zidane had played that night as well. Although the best Galactico moment, I think, of the whole evening. Um, and of course, I mean, Ica Casillas, he wouldn't be considered a Galactico, certainly at that time. And I, I think uh, I think the commentator says at one point, I can't remember if it's if it's Ron Atkinson or um, who's the main, who's the lead commentator, um, ITV at the time, not, uh, is it Clive Tilsley? Yeah, probably. Yeah, could I'm going to yeah. say David Niven, but uh, with little. I think little it's Tilsley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he says something about yeah, he's he's quite good, especially for a short goalkeeper, um, something like that. And it, you know, Casillas, look what he went on to do: World Cup winner. You know, won everything in in the game, and you know, for a short goalkeeper, probably two about short six goalkeepers, foot. one at either end. Tommy, yes, inspiration yeah. for you there. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And uh, there's still there's still hope for me yet at uh, five foot eleven and a half. Mm -hmm. I do round up on dating profiles to six foot, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, it was the best Galactico moment was John O'Shea, and I was so annoyed it didn't show this on the highlights. And I'm sure there's videos of it out there on on you know TikTok or Instagram or whatever. John O'Shea nutmegged Luis Figo, and that was the biggest cheer even bigger than probably R9 getting the <laughs> sun ovation. A 21, 22-year-old, John O'Shea, uh, right next to us, well, not next to us, about a couple hundred feet away, but, you know, next to that north stand, that huge north stand, just having the goal, having the temerity to not Meg Lewis Figo was just, oh, that was amazing. Um, but, yeah, no. it was it's Zidane for me as well, Tim. It's definitely Zidane for me. And obviously we're we're bigging up Real Madrid, but let's not forget that in this ninety minutes, Man United actually won the game. Yes, so there's <laughs> yeah. plenty of virtues there. What are the standouts for you from this this Man United side, both on the night and in general at that time? Oh, it's definitely. I mean, Ruud van Nistelrooy sticks out, and the more the older I get, the more because it was always a thing I remember during that period, uh, and I was very tribal about it in the. I said Van Nistelrooy. It was always Van Nistelrooy or Henri. Which would you have, or or who's the better one? And and obviously, I as a 13, 14 year old, I was vehemently pro Van Nistelrooy. But you know, even he was just he's even better than I remember looking back at him. His all round game is so underappreciated. Like I think it's when it's nil nil. There's there's a he takes on a couple of people and then has a shot from like a. 85 degree angle that's on target that forces a save from Casillas. And then later on, there's one from about 30 yards. He never seemed to miss the target. And Sol Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was on the Gary Neville's uh, podcast recently. And he said, you know, Roy Keane and other people say it all the time, but Solskjaer is one of the club's greatest ever 
you know, clinical finishers said, oh, Van Nistelrooy was the best, the best finisher I've ever seen. And anyone who seemed to have played with him says the same sort of thing. So, yeah, Van Nistelrooy, and he, you know, what did he, 40 goals a season for about four or five years. You know, you can't argue with that. But, um, yeah, my hero was, I mean, from a young lad, it was Beckham. And I was devastated because back then I'd, you know, I'm a season ticket holder now, but that, back then we'd go, you know, between three and five, six games a season, home games, you know, depending because, you know, there's a lot of kids. So depending on how many that, that we could afford or, or whatever, or what tickets came up. And luckily we got tickets that night. Um, but yeah, Beckham was someone who, you know, if I, if we went to Old Trafford and he wasn't playing, you'd just be gutted. And there was this whole, funnily enough, we'd actually been to the Arsenal game that was maybe a week before where Ferguson kicked the boot at Beckham because Beckham's still wearing the, the scar and he's still wearing his bloody hair back so the whole world knows about it. will it. never catch on that hairstyle. <laughs> Thankfully, never, yeah. Ever catch on. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm sure I tried it. A very young me will will have but, tried so it. So the, the hairstyle was because I, I missed out on all of this. You know, the hairstyle was a message. Yeah, he he uh, he was wearing it back at that point. I think he talks about it on the documentary, and he denies it. But everyone else is like, I think even Neville is like, oh, he was definitely trying to show it off. Um, so yeah, it was it was after Ferguson kicked the boot on it, and, and it was a message. And then there was the whole debate before the game. I remember on on the radio heading there. Um, and in the papers, the whole discussion was whether, because Veron had been out for about, you know, I think about six weeks and it was whether, you know, he'd try and get Veron in and then Beckham on the right or, uh, and drop Solskjaer or whether, you know, he was rushing Veron back to kind of make a point, which is kind of, I, I think what he did and Veron, Veron had to come off, I think on about 60th minute or something like that. Um, so the other argument could have been Solskjaer was playing well on the right, so you could have put Beckham in centre midfield and then and kept Solskjaer out on the right. But Ferguson was obviously proving a point, and then Beckham comes on with his own point to prove, scoring you know arguably one of his best free kicks from like a sort of funny angle for a right foot, which was which was his genius. Again, another underappreciated player, I think. I always think. I, I know that gets said a lot, that Beckham is an underrated player because of the superstar he became. But I was thinking about, I was had to write something for work about Wayne Rooney, and I was thinking about players who have provided me with the most moments of sort of inspiration or magic from football, in live in the flesh at Old Trafford anyway. And it's probably only Beckham that comes close to, to Rooney in terms of that, in terms of consistently doing it over the years. Obviously, Cristiano Ronaldo, um, but, you know, it's kind of boring, kind of goes without saying. But, yeah, David De Gea, he was another one later on. But, you know, yeah, Beckham was, he was always box office, really. And he always seemed to do something. He always, like, whether it was a goal or assist or just hitting the crossbar with a free kick, he was just always, you know, as a as a child, as a thirteen year old, that's the sort of player that you that you want to see playing for your club. What had happened with that that relationship between him and Ferguson? How had that broken down? I think it was from everything I've read about it and take from it. I think Ferguson lost control. I think Ferguson, anyone who undermined any sort of aspect of his pure author authoritarian control over that club um and you know i i don't think it was the case i don't you know beckham was still every year he won the bleep test in pre in pre-season he was the fittest player on the pitch no matter how famous no matter how many magazine or covers he was on or, or newspaper covers he was on but ferguson didn't like that he was i guess overshadowing the club in a way you know he was he was and still is like a, an entity in himself um I didn't think that was really a problem. And, you know, maybe in hindsight, I'd see it slightly differently. But I think no one was more heartbroken over David Beckham leaving Man United than David Beckham. Like, no one was more. And you see that the way he still speaks about it now. Like, it it, it killed him. And the 
the fact that he recovered that relationship with Ferguson shows how much he, you know, he's he's still sort of indebted to him and he's still in love with the club and he's still in love with with Sir Alex Ferguson, like unlike Roy Keane, who's very stubborn about it. And he's like, you know, I'm right, he's wrong and we'll never talk again. But yeah, Beckham made his amends and when he would come back to Old Trafford, he came back for AC Milan later on and someone from the crowd, it was when the anti-Glazer protests were at their, you know, at their peak and someone from the crowd threw a green and gold scarf on, which which Beckham adorned. So he he always felt like he was he was one of us and it was... It was devastating to see the way it went, but again, in hindsight, it was the right decision because it was a, it was a, it was a, you know, ships in the night moment almost with him and Cristiano Ronaldo. And that, and it was, the, it was probably the right time to sell Beckham, get a bit of money for him while his his powers are, you know, his best days are probably maybe not past him, but are passing uh, in the next couple of years. And sign an 18-year-old Cristiano Ronaldo who'd, you know, gone to become the second best player in the world. So uh he gets those two goals. He gets it's a fabulous free kick. And then the last one is 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 a is a tap in on, on what really is a is a, is an own goal. But the game's kind of already gone then, isn't it? They're, they're, all right, they get their goals that win the game for United on the night, but the 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 place in the next round has already sailed. Yeah. And the goal that's clinched that is Ronaldo's third. Oh. And the first one we talked about, the second one is a great team goal. Yes. It's, it's, it's actually, I think he has to adjust his feet quite well to put in the cross from Roberto Carlos. It's not quite as easy as it looks. And there's a, a man on him, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's a, so it's a great team goal. But the third one, the one that completes the hat trick, is. It, that's it's, the one. Yeah. That's what the one. It? Talk us through it. Um, God, all I, all I remember is, is again, the, the first thing I, I recall is the silence after it. And then that was, yeah, that was the final nail in the coffin. I can't remember what the score would have been at that point. Uh, but he collects the ball. Can you just, who, who gives him the ball? I can't remember how he gets the ball, but well, he's... the, the key thing for me in this is just how quickly his mind works because he's quite a long, long way away from goal Yes. when he gets the ball. And then there's a run. Someone, one of his teammates goes outside him, that run towards the left flank. And that just takes the defender. And then, he, so he sees, hang on, the defender has moved, so there's space for me to go inside. A couple of and inches. He, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's not very much, but yeah. that, that, run, that run from the teammate, has just opened up the door for me a little bit. Carry the defenders, open up the door, so I've got space to go inside, and that's where the goal is. Yeah. And then the shot, it, oh. it's one of those shots that just reminds you of, like, it reminds me of darts. Yes. And it's almost like he's picked it up and just put it in the top corner, only, <laughs> you know, from, a, from like, 35 yards or something like that. Yeah. Now that, that, that was darts. You know, three it's versions darts. of... It's darts thrown with a spear, though. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Beautiful, yeah. yeah. And it's, three it's, versions of Bartes wouldn't have stopped it. No, it's true, and it's it's one of those. Um, I think often these days it's always thought of as the sort of Thierry Henry finish, that sort of inside of the foot. But you know, most of Thierry Henry's sort of versions of that. And Michael Owen was another one actually who was, who was really good at that sort of finish. Where and I saw Henry speaking about it recently. He's like. You know, basically, the the aim is that wherever the keeper moves, like you just said, Tim, three three Barteses wouldn't have stopped it. Wherever the keeper moves, whatever his starting position is, if if you're putting it that far in the corner and that well placed, and it's just something from the training, it's just repetition, I imagine, like practice, practice, practice. But if if you're putting it at that place in the net, in the got in the side net, in then you know no keeper's going to stop it. But it's the fact that he's doing that sort of finish with power and pace from about 30, like you say, 30 yards out, yeah. not, not 10, 15 yards, not in the box. Like he's doing it from that distance. And as, as a great Mancunian voice once said, it's the three R's repetition, repetition, repetition. <laughs> yes. Repetition. <laughs> no, what the great Mancunian uh, said was um, failure to prepare 
is preparation <laughs> for failure. <laughs> and he said it in the way the accent I said it in. That, that's what repetition is. Now, do you know what I thought when I saw this? Um, European football nights are made for fairy tales and we yeah. don't see it enough. We don't see it enough. Um, you know, you got a match that's not in daytime, it's at nighttime, so you've got all the floodlights, you've got all the expectations. End of it's April, got... spring in the air. Oh, what a, what, yeah, what a exactly. wonderful time to be alive. Exactly. It really was. And it looks like a movie when you watch it because yeah. you're thinking, you know, Escape yeah. to Victory, it's got George Best in it, it's got yeah. Bobby Moore in it, it's yeah. got all the stars in it, and it delivers, you know. Um, it's like a 12 year old's picked those two teams. It's like yeah. the, me, a 13 year old, me and my brother had just said, like, who's the 22 players you want to watch right now? Yeah. And it would, it would be something from, close to that. From all over the world. And think how quickly that, that's happened. You, you, you go back not even 10 years earlier than this. Yeah. And you got none of this. No, in, in, in the United side, you've got a, a World Cup winning goalkeeper from France. You've got Silvestri from France. You've got Veron from Argentina. You got Solskjaer from Norway, Van Nist Van Nistelrooy from 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 Holland. All this was new, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. So because Ferguson had to, you know, drop Schmeichel in the Champions League ten years earlier because of the, right. the the what, number of four four foreign players rule. Yeah. So to have this, and at that time, that must have been so exciting and so glamorous. Maybe Premier League fans have been spoiled now and have just been, you know, that's what it is. But this yeah. this was almost groundbreaking in its accumulation of glamour in the club game, wasn't it? Yeah, and I've never seen anything since like it. And I've seen, you know, I've seen PSG. I've seen, I've seen their version of the the Galacticos play at Old Trafford, and it, there's nowhere near the sort of allure and history and and revelry about it. You know, like last night, I was just walking around Ancoats and. I to to be honest, I totally forgot that City were playing Copenhagen at home. Um and the reason I remembered was because I'd I'd driven to um I'd driven to the Asda to get some pe petrol and all the roads were closed off. So I had to come back round round the way I live and, and go a different route. Anyway, I ended up walking to the shop and and yeah, the, the, all the city and Copenhagen fans were sort of I'm not saying like, you know, bring back the days of sort of of violence or or passion or like in that way in that sort of masochistic way or, or whatever but it was just very it was very placid it was very boring and then I saw the result the game itself was fucking boring you know the, like the no the no away goal rule thing I, I think that's kind of killing the Champions League a bit and the Champions League's not really there's exciting no, there's no jeopardy the, no there's, there's no jeopardy the semi-final there's nothing really I don't know who came up with that rule because the, <laughs> I mean, if, funny enough, you know, it's just part of what makes the difference in this match, the desperation of Manchester United to score more. You know, every time you see Ronaldo uh, bang a goal in from outside the box, it increases the jeopardy yeah. for you. Um, <laughs> They're up the other end. Yeah. I, I think after Van Nistelrooy's first goal, or a, a goal, Manchester United's first goal, Van Nistelrooy rushes into the, you know, he goal does. and grabs yeah. the ball because I like, put it on the centre spot, we're going to score more kind of thing, or we've got to score more. Um, you know, another thing about this is you started off by saying that until you saw this match, uh, you know, the highlight of your footballing trajectory was playing football manager. And I thought to myself, yeah, you are so, you've got a different um, trajectory than myself and Tim, who, you I've know. I've never played we, it. I don't even know what it is. Well, we got into <laughs> football through Subutio. That was the closest yeah. to football manager. So when you were playing football manager, we were playing Subutio with probably as much, if not more, passion in the yeah. days when, you know, the kind of goal that Ronaldo scores here, you could score if you had, you know, the right finger to score with. <laughs> it's a beauty. Um, th th there is so, there's so much magic in this game. It's probably, and rightly so, considered to be one of the best games of football ever. Yeah. Um, and probably better, I would say, than, you know, there are World Cup moments, but I haven't seen one like this. Well, well these are club sides, aren't they? They play together every, every week. So, yeah. uh, 
But but it's but also like European difference. club size. They've got the best players from around the world, like you say. Yeah. You know, it's not just um, what the national team can muster up and stuff. Okay, so, something you touched on quickly, Don, before we go to the music. The uh, about it being like a movie and and the magic of it. And yeah, you, you're right that also Real Madrid's kit. I, I should mention that oh, they're good. all black kit. Yeah, it's good. And it's... and they had that sort of um, they had a font on the back of their shirts that was almost like because Premier League was very set. We had like you know, I think maybe back then it was Nike might have had a different style of Champions League name and number, but Premier League we all have the same. Whereas La Liga was still a bit more uh, a bit more cowboy in that sense and. The names on the back of the shirt is actually very cowboy. It's very Western. It's written in like that sort of that Western font. Uh, and McAlee's so they, name, I remember seeing yeah, that and thinking, and it, wow, it looks good. It's very easy as a 13-year-old to be like, they're the baddies, we're the goodies. <laughs> <laughs> Although with McAlee, uh, if you don't mind me saying so, Juan Sebastian Veron was the baddie there yeah, I've, yeah. I've never seen McAlealy, um <laughs> crushed like that into the ground and I felt sorry for him because he's a, he's supposed to be the hard man but I, I think it, you're right to bring in the kit because Real Madrid of course they are Los Blancos and have been the you know you, you expect to see Real Madrid in a Champions League or European Cup previously match wearing all white but the all black adds a little you know, something to it, a swagger that the all-white doesn't have. I looked at that and thought, you know, Manchester United, you're expecting them to be in red and white. You you kind of knew what to expect from Manchester United to a certain extent, but with Real Madrid, you didn't know what to expect. In terms of, just very quickly, the two managers as well. I mean, you talked about Fergie, and I think the elephant in the room is not seeing Beckham on the pitch. And then when he comes on the pitch, it's still the elephant in the room. It's like, why did you have him on from the beginning? In terms of just looking at the way that they set out their teams, which manager was the better for you? I mean, it's hard to say because I suppose Del Bosque has, uh, you know, he, he went on to win the World Cup with Spain and win a Euros with Spain. But he always seemed to me like almost a bit, this is probably really unfair and Tim can probably answer better, but, you know, it always seemed to me like he was one of those managers who was just a great guy, like a bit of a, he, he kind of, he, he knew how to control their, their egos in the sense that he probably just gave them a lot of freedom. Um, whereas Fergie's the opposite, total control. And there has been a, this thing, and it's interesting. I saw a thing on Twitter the other day from Rennie Moulinstein saying, you know, Keane, Gar Gary Neville and Roy Keane, et cetera, have sort of been playing down how tactical Man United were. And it was all about, again, repetition and patterns on the pitch and mm -hmm. just purely training being so competitive. Because every Friday at training, they used to do the um, an international 11 versus the England 11. And that was that was a higher standard of game that they could ever play in the Premier League, really. Like, you know, their World eleven versus their English eleven, And that was how it worked. But then Rennie Moonstein kind of refuted it and said, no, Fergie was very tactical. It's just, you know, he doesn't sort of, you know, times have changed and he doesn't bang on about it. So I don't know, in terms of setup, I don't, it's hard to get that team wrong, you would maybe argue. But then it, as it was proven, when Claude McAlealy went to Chelsea either the next summer or the one after that Real Madrid team absolutely fell apart. I remember... Brazil 2006? Yeah. Ronaldo, yeah. Adriano, Kaká, Ronaldinho. A disaster. Yeah. No. If it, if it looks as simple as Real Madrid make it look, there's some hard work going on behind the scenes to make it, Very to make it look simple. Of course. Very of course. true. Yeah, like the Beatles. <laughs> Talking There's of nothing which... like the Beatles here, is there? But go on, go on, go on. Yeah, um, she started the number one. Dear, oh dear, What's oh the dear, point? oh dear. What's yeah, the point? Yeah, well, what's the fucking got... point? It's just, it's Oliver Cheat and you... Get Down Saturday Night, and this some other Italian DJ has put his name to it and said, and said he's made a song. It's not. It's Oliver Cheat and Get Down Saturday Night. Mm. Let's, let's have the original. It's better anyway. Yeah. What's the fucking yeah. point? <laughs> what is, I agree. I, I, 
Uh, well, I, I knew that you'd be like this about the chart, <laughs> but um, do you not think you have to sort of register the number one song, nevertheless? Yeah, one yeah, you have to moan about it. Why not? <laughs> yeah. um, one of the few pleasures I still have in these days of ours. I, I <laughs> do you blame the DJ or do you blame the the combination of performers? We're talking spirit in the sky, yeah. Oh God, for crying out loud, Tommy, defend it. What, what what is good here? What do you like? What is salvable from about uh, spirit from in the, the sky? Oh, no, God. no, from the from the entire chart. Oh, oh, the, oh uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I... you, you just very quickly say spirit in the sky. It's not the doctor and the medics version. It's not the original. It's the <laughs> in case you missed it, Gareth Gates. Yeah, remember him? <laughs> reality? T no, not reality. B was like pop stars, wasn't he? And the Kumars, who yeah. were you know the Kumars at number forty-seven, sort of Asian sitcom or whatever uh, you want to describe it. I don't know what possessed them, and they did the. The spirit, I remember from the video that they did the spirit like, you know, some Indian guru. So therefore, we sort do, of yeah. converted the spirit into something that was very naturally Indian or something like that. And that made it even worse. Actually. And then they stick all the sitars on it, don't they? And and there you go. Rip. Well, talking of sitars, though, there is one decent track here from an Indian perspective. Um Blur? <laughs> that's not a bad tune in the blur one the year 3000 there's an indian that feel coming coming in there in um out of time there's an indian feel in feeling it i didn't i've never heard that i thought that i mean it's a great song actually. i think it is and i think it's the one of the sort of weenie bop songs in this chart that has kind of survived actually um I, I didn't hear the Indian field. No, I was thinking about Punjabi MC. All right. Yeah, um, yeah. With uh, the tune that <laughs> I'm trying to see because you'll never remember the title unless you actually look at it. No, no. no. <laughs> so, I, I, I'm I looking at the same. Yeah, I, I remember Punjabi MC coming out of nowhere on Top of the Pops. It did look good, Tim, because, you know, you know what you're getting from Top of the Pops. Suddenly, this sort of Indian guy with a turban comes from an angle. He's not, like, on stage <laughs> when the camera's there. Do you remember this? He, like, mm, comes from an angle, like, from where the audience is. And then and he's, you know, he's doing the kind of, like, doing all the drumming and everything like that. And <laughs> there's, he, there's one I, I want to lay on, on Tommy, um, on. which is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Date with the night. Yeah, yeah. Which I think is kind of interesting, and because th this is this is my theory, I want to test on you. Go on. I think that one one of the tragedies of indie music is that it it ended it severed the link between British music and the rhythm that had come from Black America. I think yeah. indie severed that link, uh, and that's not a good process for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of from that indie scene, but you can hear the blues in it. Yes. So that that that's that kind of made it stand out to me. Where do you where do you hear it in in her voice? In, no, it's in the, in the rhythm. It's in the rhythm section as well. Right. Was, okay. You, you can hear some kind of maybe early free in it or something. Yeah. You know, yeah. This... I, I I you've said that I've heard you say this before, and I I think there's definitely a point to it, but I I think a lot of that a lot of that indie thing. I suppose it comes from post punk, which comes from punk. So, mm, yeah, good maybe point. the blame lays at punk's no, punk store. But on, I'm not does. necessarily saying blame. It, you know, I'm I I you know I I love a lot of this music, but I don't think you can blame it on punk. Not no, I mean, certainly either. not when you look at the Clash. But I'll tell you what happens. True. It's not so much the music that has abandoned the blues. It's that indie just was a white audience. Something happened in punk because the initial punk gigs were reggae and punk together. So the same audience, the same audience were going to gigs where there'd be a punk band and a reggae band and another punk band and a reggae band. So you Don Letts has a lot to do with that, because he? he was a DJ. There were yeah. no punk records out. So yeah. if you're in the club between the bands or something like that, you know, what do you want to play? What have you got to play? But put on a reggae. Yeah, crucially, the I mean, at this point, this was the days of um, we're talking about 76, 77, uh, maybe stretching into 78. But I think it's a hard push at that point because that's when they start going their separate ways. But 
you, you imagine dreads and punks together and it is actually quite you know a idiosyncratic because black people like uh people black people of uh caribbean heritage who everybody was in locks in those days were all in locks getting into the rasta thing were like working class the original working class white people in that we dressed well so we couldn't kind of understand i say we because i kind of i was a punk but i didn't rip up my shirts and things like that i just couldn't bring myself to <laughs> do those things yeah. you know yeah. I, I, I wore my collar up or whatever it was but it was like oh, you, well, you, you're already by virtue of your color you're already an outsider you could argue that although... doesn't matter what you wear you're already an outsider the yeah. punk by yeah. the way that he is dressing and it, it didn't start like that, did it? I mean, it, it got more the, the kind of rich shirt and safety pin look. If you look at the certainly the photos of '76, it's just like normal people. But Not it, quite, it, it became but like a declaration of being an outsider. I tell you what, the punks looked like in 1976. They looked like um, Rick, whatever his name is, in the young ones. They, were like, <laughs> they wore they, no, they wore tight um, like school blazers that they got well, from just jumble short sales. hair was a revolutionary but, statement wasn't it if you didn't comb it if you didn't comb it yeah that's true but they wore kind of like a school blazer but with safety pins on it mm -hmm. like yeah, shane, shane mcgowan as a punk before the pose yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that, that's yeah. how i think of of that sort of early punk. But, but by the time this comes through by the time the indie music we're talking about come through um you know blacks have gone their way and whites have gone their way and the meeting point at gigs just didn't happen anymore, but probably mm -hmm. from about 1978. I think yeah. that's what happened because there's no reason why black kids shouldn't like um, indie music. There's no reason. I mean, some of it actually appeals directly to us. But I think and there was a couple. There was there was block party, wasn't there? There was block party. Yes. There was a band called Black Kids around that well, time. Look at Eminem. He's got a couple of tracks in the charts now. Lose and also, yourself, amongst other things, remember Eminem was yeah. the biggest rap star of his day. At this point, Fifty Cent has just come in with uh, in the club. But before that, it was and it was Eminem that brought. Um, uh, 50 cent in he's the one yes. that took him to we, we, we got to put the ball on, on the penalty spot for tommy because he's got to run and be fabian Barthez. cool so tommy cool. your chart what do you like defend it <laughs> oh i can't defend much of it but yeah as don says lose yourself i mean that's it's, it's a great song it's you know maybe it's a bit of a maybe it's hip-hop's wonderwall in the sense of it's of how much it's been sort of overplayed and overused on motivational scenes or or and things like that but lyrically it like it tells the story brilliantly and concisely and it's it's a cap it's very catchy for a sort of not for hip-hop songs there's a lot of catchy hip-hop songs but it is a very catchy song but i love I, maybe guiltily i love uh justin timberlake's cry me a river brilliant yeah. pop song brilliant yeah. pop song um yeah. which would have been produced by timberland and and come from that sort of house of of well, come from hip hop roots, actually. But my favorite song in the whole chart, of one that I is on most of my playlists to this day, is at thirty nine, and it's "Hey Ma" by Cameron. Yeah, it's uh, a good one. It's a great song. It's just a great. Uh, it's a great. It reminds me of being a kid. It reminds me of that sort of time. Um, Kanye West produced him. I don't think he produced this song, but it's just a great. Um, there was that pop hip hop at the time that was like you know. Uh, a decent rapper, you know, you'd have Old Dirty Bastard on mm -hmm. a lot of these sort of songs with like Mariah Carey or someone like that. It was of that sort of specific genre of early 2000s, late 90s, um, a great hooky pop chorus with, you know, a, with a decent rap verse either side of it. So, yeah, that's my standout on this track. And it's not, yeah, n not nowhere near uh, Gareth Gates or I've just noticed Darius on there. Yeah, and one of yeah. those sort of Leave him alone. He's not here to defend himself anymore. <laughs> oh, um, shit. No, it's not. <laughs> R.I.P. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah. Thank shit. you. What Tommy, an excellent... Tommy, on your way to be Fabian Barthez, but for God's sake, remember to cover your near post. <laughs> <laughs> We've not lost a match uh, <laughs> since I've started playing for that team. So there you go. Rock on, Tommy.
<laughs> Cheers, guys.